Okay, it's uh, welcome everyone to the Zach seminar, it's the last seminar in uh, this year. And uh, it's my big pleasure to introduce Lin Kwan Ma, who will talk about the homology of coherent shifts on singular varieties. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. And I, mean, I thank everyone who is here to participate in this, uh, this seminar. It's almost uh, holiday time. Here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the title is the cohomology table of uh, coherent sheaves on singular projective uh, varieties. <clears throat> so this is a uh, joint work with uh, Shrikan Younger and uh, Mark Walker. Oh, okay, so uh, all right. So X is a projective variety over a field K and uh, F is a coherent sheaf on, uh, on X. And so uh, we uh, define the uh, cohomology table of F. <clears throat> this encodes information about the, um, the cohomology of each twist of F. It's an, uh, it's an array of numbers in this um, uh, infinite dimensional vector space. Uh, I have two index ij, so the ijth entry is the uh, ith cohomology of the uh, f twisted by j. Okay, so, uh, and the cone of cohomology tables, which in this talk I will uh, denote it by uh, c of x. Um, this is the positive uh, q, uh, non-negative uh, Q span of the cohomology tables is uh, for uh, F ranges over all coherent sheaves on X. All right, and uh, so uh, I will also use, so this does not come up uh, very often, but I will also use CR of X uh, to denote the, uh, the corresponding cone if you're, uh, if you're working over the, uh, the real numbers. All right, so I just set up some notation. Uh, and uh, there's an analog picture for, uh, for graded rings and the uh, Betty tables of modules. So let me also introduce that. So uh, I let R be a standard graded ring over a field K. Uh, and uh, M is a graded R module of finite length. In other words, uh, the support of this module is uh, at the irrelevant ideal of R. <clears throat> So uh, I will uh, also assume M has finite projective dimension. Uh, so which means there, uh, there exists a, uh, if you read, uh, it, there is a finite free resolution of uh, M. So by, by free modules of R. Uh, so the, this condition is, will be automatic if R is a polynomial ring over K by the Hilbert uh, synthesis theorem. So, and at least for the first half of the talk, I will just, stick with the polynomial ring case so you don't need to worry about this condition so i just have a so just have a, a polynomial ring and a module of finite length all right uh, and so then i introduced the betty table of m uh, so this is uh, also a, a, an array of numbers lives inside this uh, infinite dimensional uh, q vector space whose uh, ijth entry is the dimension of the uh, uh, jth graded piece of the tor i of m with respect to k. So, it, so these numbers can be read off in a, if you write down a graded free resolution of m. So I will give you some examples. Uh, but this, uh, this is a, a, well, it lives in a double direct sum because uh, each table is just finite uh, non-zero entries because it has, uh, it has finite resolution. So that's where we, this assumption is. Um, and the cone of Betty tables, uh, or we, in community algebra, we also say, call it the boy Soderberg cone, uh, because these two persons, they made some uh, intriguing conjectures on, the, on this cone. So I think that's why we call it. Uh, but the, the cone of Betty tables, uh, in this talk, I will denote it by uh, B of R, uh, which is the uh, non-negative Q 
Q span of the Betty tables when the module ranges over all uh, it ranges over all modules of finite length and finite projective dimension. Uh, right. So so far, just some notation. So uh, the Betty table and the cohomology table. All right. So I just uh, do some very uh, uh, simple example. So uh, X is the projective space, and uh, just take the structure sheaf. And we all know what is the cohomology of the structure sheaf uh, looks like. It has two uh, sort of ray of numbers. It, it, uh, so the so the h h zero. Um, okay, so sorry. Let me. So I put this circ here and this dagger. So this one here lives uh, denotes the location zero zero. So this one here means the uh, just the global section of OX. So h zero of x o x. And this is uh, H0x OX twisted by one. And you can see like these are non-zero entries. And all the, all the others are zero, except you have the, the top uh, cohomology with the negative twist. So this dagger, uh, I uh, denotes the location N and minus N minus one. So, so this is just saying like HN, um, HN of uh, OX twisted by minus N minus one is one dimension. And similarly, you imagine that there's an array of numbers here. Okay, so this is what a concrete example, what a cohomology table of a sheaf looks like. So it contains a lot of information about the, uh, it contains all the information about the cohomology of every twist of the sheaf. Uh, and this is another example. I just want to give a, a slight uh, non-trivial example. So take the tangent sheaf on P2. Uh, that's uh, uh, the cohomology table looks like this. So, so this circ here means again means location zero zero. So this eight just means the dimension of the global section of the tangent sheaf is eight. And then uh, hopefully my computation is right. So you can compute all these using the the Euler sequence. And hopefully I didn't screw up. So I got these uh, numbers. Okay, so, and let me also give you some uh, very simple example of uh, the graded ring side. So uh, for free resolution, so uh, I take a polynomial ring in two variables and I take M to be R quotient by uh, the ideal generated by X cube, uh, sorry, X square and Y cube. So this is a finite, uh, finite, module, uh, finite length graded um, module. And in this case, uh, we know what the resolution looks like because uh, this idea is generated by a regular sequence. So the kazoo complex resolve this module. And I put this uh, shifts because I want to keep track of the degree. So uh, this means this X square lives in degree two and this is Y cube lives in degree three. And uh, similarly, there's a, this lives in degree five. So this is the free resolution, very simple. And so what are the, so what is the Betty table that I introduced? So in this case, the Betty table looks like this. So let me just so where this circ here, so this one means uh, the, uh, the, I mean the, the generator of M, and um, so uh, and there's a little like uh, okay, so there, there's a convention here. So for writing this Betty tables, uh, the entry in the ith column and the jth row. Uh, corresponds to beta i uh, comma i plus j of m. So not beta i j, but beta i i plus j. So for example, in this diagram, so this, uh, this uh, in this bottom corner one, uh, this lives in, right? So, okay, so I have column zero, column one, column. So this is in column two and row three. Uh, so it corresponds to beta two five. Uh, and beta, what is beta two five? Remember, beta two five is the is the tor two in degree five, but which is precisely this r twisted by five. So this beta two five denotes uh, this copy of r. Okay. So this, this so these tors are, you know, uh, it's just the it's just you can read off all the uh, degree shifts from the free resolution, and the tors are just the, the degree in, of the general because after you tensor with K, the free resolution becomes a, you know, graded, a complex of graded vector space with like differential zero. So it's just, you can uh, read off all the tours from this. Okay, so this one 
uh, corresponds to this piece of R, and these two ones, sorry, these two ones corresponds to the shift of two and shift of uh, three. And here's another uh, simple example. Uh, uh, I, I again give a look at the polynomial ring in two variables, and m is r mod the square of the maximum ideal. And in, in this case, I have uh, the free resolution looks like this. Again, uh, so uh, this uh, shift by two because all the generators of the ideal lives in degree two, and you can check that you know there's a the sec the first synthesis lives in all in degree three. Uh, and the body table looks like this. Again, this three here corresponds to this, uh, uh, this three copies of R in uh, homological degree one. And this two here correspond to this number two, uh, which is in, uh, lives in homological degree two and uh, internal degree three. So that's this. Okay, just to give you some feeling, what is this uh, cohomology table or body table uh, looks like? All right, so, and now, uh, so, uh, okay, so here's the theorem of Eisenberg and Schreier. Uh, so it says the following. So the cohomology table of uh, any vector bundle on Pn can be written as a positive rational linear combination of uh, cohomology tables of uh, what they call the supernatural vector bundle. And uh, the cohomology table of any coherent sheaf on Pn uh, can be written as a convergent series uh, with positive real coefficients of uh, cohomology tables of uh, vector bundles supported on linear subspaces. Okay, so this is a uh, is a remarkable theorem. It gives a description of uh, the cone of the cohomology table on Pn of vector bundles and coherent sheaves. It so roughly speaking, you can view this as you know. Uh, saying like the, the extremal rays are sort of this uh, supernatural vector bundle. So let me just define what they are. So a vector bundle is called supernatural if for any T there exists at most one I such that uh, the uh, HI of uh, E of T is non-zero and that the Hilbert uh, polynomial uh, has distinct integer roots. So it's uh, th this definition doesn't play a role in the uh, later part of my talk. So I'll just give the definition, but uh, you can just think about like Asimov Schreier who gave a description of the cone and they sort of described explicitly what should be the extremal rays. So these vector bundles are somehow you should, you know, because of this, uh, it's sort of uh, easy to understand. Um, and Asimov Schreier gives, uh, you know, various constructions of these supernatural vector bundles. For, I would just say like PN, uh, sorry, the structure sheet from PN is an example. And uh, I think the uh, the tangent, uh, sorry, this this tangent shape is also an example. So you see, like for each uh, cohomology degree, there is only one, you know, like non-zero entry, and uh, so the roots of the Hilbert polynomial are like negative two and negative four in this case. So this is, I think, this is also a supernatural vector bundle. But anyway, so they didn't play any role for the rest of my talk. So I'll just skip the details. All right, and uh, so Eisenberg and Schreier used the, this result to uh, obtain information about the boy Soderberg cone. So they used this to prove the following conjecture, which was conjectured by Boy and Soderberg. So uh, the body table of uh, any graded or finite length module over the polynomial ring uh, can be expressed as a positive rational linear combination of body tables of finite length modules with pure resolution, okay? So let me just define what it is. So here, a, a graded finite, uh, a graded R module of finite length has pure resolution if the graded free resolution looks like the following, okay? So you'll see the, the condition you, you want is that in each uh, of this homological degree, you only have one shift of R, okay? You are only allowing one shift of R or equivalent if you're using the torus, it's just saying like the each tor i is uh, concentrated in uh, only is concentrated in only one degree for each for each uh, for each i. Okay, so this is so again you should view this theorem as saying like uh, they gave a description of the uh, the cone of body tables 
uh, by sort of uh, uh, telling you like, or uh, so, so the, the extreme arrays of the, this cone should be like uh, these modules that has pure resolution. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so let me just go back to this example. So this example, uh, as I did earlier, so uh, polynomial ring mod the uh, square of the maximum ideal. So this one has pure resolution because you know it, it's in good shape. So in each homological degree, uh, you only have one twist of R or one shift of R. Uh, well, the, uh, this other, this uh, simple kazoo complex in this case, uh, uh, this uh, this is not pure. This does not have pure resolution because uh, you write on the kazoo complex, you see in the first spot, I have uh, two shifts of R. Uh, so this one is not a pure resolution. And so uh, if you, so this theorem here basically tell you like, okay, so you should be able to decompose uh, this Betty table, this, the Betty table of this module uh, into a, a combination of Betty tables of pure diagrams. And, uh, and that's, it turns out that that's it. Okay, so you can see uh, this is the Betty table of M and, uh, and these are two uh, pure diagrams, right? So, I mean, each column, it has only one non-zero entry, which means like in each degree, it only has one shift. So this is what is, uh, I mean, I just try to follow their uh, isometric Schreier's algorithm to, to compute it, but hopefully I didn't make mistakes. But I think in this case, uh, this is what the decomposition uh, looks like in this. But sorry, I, it, this example may not be very illuminating because, well, this is the, this is the kazoo complex. So it's, you know, it's, it's simple enough. So you might wonder like why we need to decompose it into this uh, pure diagrams into this strange way, but, uh, there are some reasons behind behind this uh, uh, the Bernoulli Soderberg conjectures, but I, I will hopefully I will mention them uh, by the end of the talk. But so the point is that uh, uh, so uh, if if I give you a finite length module, so the resolution of M may looks like very complicated, I mean, not as simple as the Kazoo complex, but the theorem works for any uh, graded module. So you can you can decompose any. Uh, 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 the value table into a, you know a simple looking like like uh, pure diagrams. Okay, so that's the statement of the isometric Schreier theorem. Okay, so and here are some uh, quick comments. Uh, isometric Schreier also obtained uh, results uh, for this uniqueness part of these decompositions, and uh, th this I already mentioned. They they develop explicit algorithms. Uh, to compute the, these uh, decompositions. And uh, so uh, the four results of Isenberg Schreier, they also deal with resolutions of uh, Cole Macaulay modules uh, in an arbitrary uh, code in a fixed co dimension, and which was later extended to the non Cole Macaulay case by Boyan Soderberg, and further extended to the uh, perfect complexes with homology of a fixed co dimension sequence by. Eisenberg and Ehrman. And so I don't want to go to technical details here. So let me just use the finite length modules um, uh, to, uh, for the rest of my talk. So just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a key case of, of all these general results. Okay, so, and uh, all right. So the question that we want to study now is that, okay, we have this uh, beautiful result of Eisenberg Schreier giving you the description of the cone of uh, co-module table and the cone of Betty table. Uh, so the question we want to ask is that, uh, can we extend their theorems to, uh, and well, for, for the co-module table, I want to uh, say, uh, ask for the, uh, the co-module table an arbitrary projective variety. And for the cone of Betty table, I want to ask like whether there's anything we can say about the Betty table of an arbitrary uh, standard graded ring. Okay, so it could be single. So um, this question, uh, it, it, it has been studied before. So, um, so, okay, so recall we use CX is the cone of cohomology tables of all coherent shifts on X and BR is the cone of Betty tables of graded module of finite length, finite projective dimension over uh, a standard graded ring R. 
Okay, so just the notation. And uh, so, uh, so Asimov Schreier obtains the following theorem. So uh, X is a projective variety of dimension N, then this Cx is equal to C of uh, the, the Pn, uh, if and only if X admits an Ulrich sheet. And uh, we also have the uh, result. This is, uh, I think this is due to Eisenberg and Ehrman. Uh, let R be a standard graded uh, co macaulay ring of dimension n plus one. And uh, A is a polynomial ring in n plus one variables. So I was thinking like A embeds in R as a uh, northern normalization, All right? So then uh, their conclusion is that then the, the Betty table, the, the cone of Betty table, BR is equal to BA uh, if uh, the proj of R admits an Ulrich sheaf. Okay. So, um, so these two theorems are not uh, particularly uh, uh, very difficult to, uh, to prove. Uh, I'll actually sketch the proof of the first one. Uh, this is much easier to prove actually than, than the other results of asymmetry that I, that I mentioned. Uh, but I, okay, so before I, okay, I should recall what an Ulrich shift, uh, what, a, what does the Ulrich shift mean? Um, but before I do that, let me just, again, give you some comments on this. So first of all, so what, so, okay, I want to equate the two cones, right? So CX, CPN, and BRBA. So some uh, directions are obvious. So uh, CX is always contained in C of PN. So this is obvious because you can, uh, so X is a dimension N, so you can take a, a projection to the projected space. Sorry, this should be a math curly P. So I take a projection from X to PN. Uh, sorry, I, I take a linear projection. I mean, I, I want the pullback of O1 to be O1. And then uh, simply by the uh, projection formula, uh, you can see that for, um, for any coherent sheaf on X, uh, then if you compute the uh, cohomology table of F over X, uh, it's the same as the cohomology table of the push forward of F, uh, you compute it on PN. This is simply the projection formula, okay? So in other words, for every, Co-module table of X, you can you can realize it as the co-module table of some sheaf on PN. So so clearly CX is contained in CPN. Okay. So, uh, and similarly, uh, for the commutative ring side, uh, so BA is contain BA contained in BR is obvious is the obvious containment, right? Because remember A is the uh, A is the polynomial ring lives inside R, and this uh, I'm assuming R is co-macaulay. Right, well, I'm not gonna define that, but what does that mean in this context is just simply saying like uh, under this inclusion, R is a flat or even free as a module over A. So R is a finite free module over A, okay? So, and so in particular, if I give you a graded module over the polynomial ring A of finite length, so then you just uh, base change to R, you tensor with R, you got a graded R module of finite length. And because R is flat over A, uh, this module has finite projective dimension because you can take a finite resolution of M over A. And so then you tensor with R since R is flat. So, so it is still, it remains an exact sequence. It remains a resolution, okay? So this is a module of finite length and finite projective dimension. And the Betty tables are the same because remember the Betty table are completely determined by the, uh, the shifts in the graded free resolution. And if you just tensor with R, the shift doesn't change. So it's pretty easy to see that uh, this Betty table uh, for M computed over A is the same as the Betty table of this um, extended module M tensor A with R uh, computed over R. Okay, so uh, so so some uh, so certain direction of the, the inclusion of the two cones are are uh, are all uh, are always true even without the uh, the Ulrich sheaf. Okay. Uh, so let me just make one more comment. The Cole-Macaulay assumption on R is needed. So otherwise, uh, uh, BR is empty, uh, as, as, at least as, as, as what we defined. So this is due to some uh, intersection theorems in commutative algebra. So basically, uh, these theorems implies uh, if you, your, your, your ring has a uh, module of finite length and finite projective dimension, uh, so it forces, um, it forces your ring to be Cole-Macaulay, actually. Okay, so, um, 
So this assumption is needed. So beyond this Kolmogorov case, the correct generalization is to again you have to uh, look at complexes other than just modules. So this is uh, there are some statements in uh, Isman Ehrman deal with that generality. Okay. So all right. So now let me recall you the definition and properties of an Uri sheaf. Uh, so a coherent sheaf U on a projective variety is called an Uri sheaf if gamma ij, remember this means the ith cohomology of the U twisted by J, if this is zero except possibly when I is zero and J bigger than equal to zero or uh, I equals to N and J less than or equals to minus N minus one. So you'll see basically this is uh, uh, a Uri sheaf has uh, has the same vanishing uh, cohomology uh, uh, as as in the case of you know uh, uh, structure sheaf on PN. Okay, so this is a quick way to uh, to remember this. And there are various uh, characterization of this uh, Uri sheaf. Uh, so I think this is not particularly hard to prove. Or equivalently, uh, under a linear projection, the push forward is uh, is a direct sum of uh, the structure sheaf. All right, so, uh, and so now let's just quickly prove the other direction. So uh, the cone of, I want to show the cohomology table of PN is containing cohomology table of X, uh, sorry, the cone of a cohomology table of X uh, when X has an Uri sheaf. So this is quite easy actually. So uh, given any coherent sheaf on PN, uh, you just you you look at this. You look at U uh, uh, tensor with the pullback of G and twist it by J. So this one, uh, an easy exercise using the projection formula is the same as the HI you computed on PN of the push forward of this, which is the push forward of U uh, tensor with uh, this uh, shift G twisted by J. Okay, and since U is an U is shift, if you're using this characterization. The push forward of U is just a direct sum of the structure sheaf. So this is R times uh, HI of PN of G twisted by J. And so you get immediately that the cohomology table of G is one over R times the cohomology table of uh, U tensor, the pullback of G. You compute it over, uh, you compute it on X. And so in particular, so since we are looking for the cone, so we are allowing this, this rational, positive rational multiple. So the cone of Cohomology table on um, PN is contained in this uh, uh, C of X. Okay, so this is uh, is a it's a uh, very uh, simple uh, argument, um, uh, but okay. So now basically, uh, 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 oops, sorry. Uh, so okay, so we remember our goal is to understand the the cone uh, C X and B R. We want to understand the cone of cohomology table and the cone of value table for singular. X and singular R. And so now this theorem of Asimov Schreier or Asimov Ehrman, they, uh, it gave us a very uh, sort of nice answer. It says it's the, it's the same as in the case of PN or polynomial ring, provided your, uh, provided your, your variety has an Uwe sheet. So you'll say, uh, okay, so now the question of understanding the cone reduces to sort of finding an Uwe sheaf on X, okay? Uh, however, uh, uh, so unfortunately, the sad news is that um, this uh, the uh, the existence of Uri sheaves uh, turns out to be a very uh, difficult uh, question. So I believe many uh, people have made contributions of, or special made prove special cases of uh, this question, but in general, uh, as far as I understand, this is uh, still uh, wide open. So uh, I think even for smooth uh, surface or threefolds. Uh, this this question is not completely uh, answered, um, and so it, it it turns out to be very difficult. Uh, but for curves, it's fine. I think it's due to Asimov Schreier. It's a, a consequence of the Riemann rock. But uh, beyond in higher dimension, this is completely uh, open. All right, and so our uh, work uh, is to okay. So we want to understand C X. So the cone of cohomology tables and also B R the Betty table. And so uh, we want to, uh, to understand it, but uh, without sort of, uh, we want to avoid using the uh, Uri sheaf because that, that we don't know too much about that, okay? So here's a, uh, the definition that 
uh, we are introduced uh, with uh, Younger and Walker. Okay, so uh, uh, X is a projective variety of dimension N, and uh, I have a sequence of coherent sheaves on X. Uh, so we say this is oops, sorry. Uh, this is called a Liam Ulrich sequence if uh, it satisfies the following fourth condition. So the first condition, okay, I recall you the what gamma ij is the uh, dimension of the ith cohomology of f twisted by j. So first I want gamma zero zero to be non-zero. So this is just saying like uh, UE has a non-zero uh, global section. And uh, for this, uh, let, let me just skip uh, property two and three for the for the moment. Uh, so you, you should view these uh, the property two and three are some like sort of mild uh, uniformity result, but let me skip them for the moment. So that's just, so property four is the most important one. So the condition we want is that uh, except possibly when uh, i equals to zero and t bigger than equals zero, or uh, i equals to n and t less than or equals to minus n minus one, uh, we have uh, this limit, it's zero, okay? So what is gamma i t? Gamma i t is the ith cohomology of u e twisted by t. I want, I want, basically I want this cohomology uh, sort of uh, to be asymptotically small compared with the global sections of UE, okay? So let's just think a bit, okay. So if I have an actual Ulrich shift, right? So then I claim this, the constant sequence. So if you set UE equals to U uh, for every E, so this is a uh, Lim Ulrich sequence, right? So let's come back to here because look, so if UE is an actual Ulrich shift, so then all the numerators here are, are zero, they vanish, right? Because Right, so because this is precisely the again i equals to zero t uh, bigger than zero and i equals to n t less than equals to this. These are precisely the uh, you know the the non-vanishing range of the uh, the cohomology of the structure shift of P n. Okay, so if you have an actual Ulrich shift, so all the numerators here are all zero. So this limit is is trivially uh, zero. Okay, and also okay, so now let's. Uh, Go back to this property two and three. Uh, if I fix a coherent sheaf here, all right. So let's think about what is gamma zero of t. That's the uh, global section of U E twisted by t. But of course, if I if I have a coherent sheaf, if you twist it by sufficiently negative uh, uh, sufficient negative t, so there's no global section, right? So this this is zero uh, for t sufficiently small. If I for, for any sheaf, if I fix a sheaf, this is always zero for t of any small. So this condition, what we are just sort of putting here is we want like, uh, you know, you look at the, you pay attention to the order of this. So I want this to be like, uh, I want a t zero that works simultaneously for every uh, every e. So this is some sort of uniformity result for this, uh, for this uh, uh, vanishing of the uh, uh, h zero. And similarly, for, for this uh, third assumption, uh, sorry, so property three, so gamma it of ue, right? So this is the ith cohomology of ue twisted by t. And if i bigger than equal to one, if I look at individual shift here, so this is always gonna be vanished for t sufficiently large by by uh, by Sarah vanishing. Okay, so, uh, so basically this property is nothing but saying like, I want a t1 that works simultaneously for all e. So that's why I said like two and three should be viewed as some uh, uniformity result on this um, on this sheaf, and four is the the most crucial sort of uh, the the Ulrich condition. Okay, so you should you should think about this sheaf as you know they asymptotically behaves uh, like an uh, an Ulrich sheaf. Okay, all right. So we introduce this uh, uh, maybe a little bit technical uh, notation, but uh, so now we okay. So we ask two questions. So first of all, whether they are useful, and secondly, like uh, whether uh, whether they exist. Okay, so let me first answer the, the second question. So uh, so this is uh, well, what we proved. So if, if X is a projective variety uh, over a perfect field K of positive characteristic, so then uh, X admits a beam Ulrich sequence of coherent shift. Okay, so other than this Ulrich module, which we know is very hard to construct, uh, but this uh, this weakening, this lim Ulrich sequence, uh, it turns out they they always exist in at least in positive characteristic. So 
uh, let me uh, sketch the construction. So this is actually the idea is uh, simple. So you take a linear projection from X to P n, and we consider the you also consider this natural projection from a, a product of P one. So this is n product of n, cop n copies of P one to P n. And uh, since uh, we are in the characteristic P, we are in the positive characteristic, we have the Frobenius map. So I let uh, capital F to the E uh, to denote the E rate of the Frobenius map on X. Okay. And so given these uh, data, so uh, we construct the following. So I look at, okay, so I, on this product of P1, uh, I look at this uh, line bundle. So I, for the first copy, I twist it by P to the E, P is the characteristic. And uh, for the second uh, P1 copy of P1, I twist it by two times P to the E. And for the nth copy, I twist it by N times P to the E. And so this is a line bundle on this, on this product of P1. I push forward to Pn, to the projected space, and pull back to X, and then push forward along the Frobenius on X. Okay. And so now the, the, uh, our, the, the conclusion is that this, that's it. So this is, this is a, a lim uh, sequence. Okay. So uh, I will, uh, I will omit the proof. The proof is a, it's, it's a little bit tedious, but it's, 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 it's elementary. It's, it's nothing. Well, it's, it just comes down to, well, so you have to, you want to check this shape, satisfy these four conditions. So that comes down to, you know, computing this, uh, you know, dimension of the uh, shift cohomology of each twist. And I believe, I think if you are, if you are diligent enough, you can, you can even compute the, uh, the precise dimension of each, uh, uh, you know, cohomology of uh, each twist of UE. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's some like computation using using some uh, simple uh, uh, spectral sequence or, or uh, format. So nothing beyond that. Okay, but it just 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 work, right? So you have to check this. All right, so uh, let me make some more comments on this construction. Of course, I I put two sets of authors uh, here. Uh, so okay, so uh, so in my previous work, I I uh, I first uh, come up with this construction of uh, a lim which sequence of uh, graded modules over graded rings. Uh, this was defined in terms of multiplicity and Kazu homology. And I do that in order to prove some uh, special cases of a conjecture of lack on multiplicities in commutative algebra. Okay. And after this construction, uh, together with uh, Younger and Walker, we, we realized that th th this construction is really uh, about the construction of uh, some sheaves. So we, we, we base, so we basically sheafify that construction, you get, you get this construction that I, that I give you here. Okay. And, uh, but interpreting this using sheaves, you know, allow us to, uh, uh, well, we, we, we recovered this, this, uh, some results inside here, uh, but we also uh, carry the computation further. Uh, so for example, we, uh, we compute the class of this, this, Associate graded modules gamma star of U E uh, in the uh, Grothendi group of R, uh, and in order to obtain some uh, more applications uh, to multiplicities. Okay. Um, all right. So, but the application that I'm gonna uh, talk about today is to use this uh, uh, Lim Wuish sequence instead of an actual uh, Wuish module uh, to study the cone of cohomology table and the cone of body table. So uh, just recall the, the, uh, the, the notation CX, uh, this is the cone of cohomology table, CR is the corresponding real cone, and BR is the cone of body table. Okay, so uh, the first theorem we proved is that uh, X is a projective variety of dimension N defined over a perfect field of uh, positive characteristic. And then, um, uh, the, the real cone, uh, CR of X and CR of PN have the same closure in the pointwise convergence topology. Okay. And the second theorem, uh, all joined work Younger and Walker, we show that this is the uh, ring side of this. Uh, so let R be a standard graded Kolmogorov ring of dimension N plus one uh, over a field K and let A be a 
polynomial ring in, uh, with uh, n plus one variables. Again, I'm thinking about like A embedded in R as a uh, linear northern normalization, right? So then we can prove the Betty cone of R or the boyle soderberg cone of R is the same as the boyle soderberg cone of A, okay? So in the, in the uh, well, you can see, okay, so here for the, for the uh, cone of coherent sheaves, we get a, we get a description uh, up to closure, right? And in the uh, in the result for uh, for graded rings, uh, the result is uh, it's strong. Right? So um, I make this comment here. The result for the cone of Betty tables is uh, apparently it's stronger. Uh, we can actually equate uh, BR with BA, and not only just proving their limit are the same. Uh, oh, and, and also the this sec the second theorem holds in arbitrary character. So here. Uh, so the, in the first theorem, I'm assuming K has character P, and in the second theorem, uh, it works for uh, uh, in arbitrary characteristic. Um, and so uh, our four results for the Betty tables also uh, can deal with um, some the version of perfect complexes uh, whose homology is compatible with a fixed co-dimension sequence. And so, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce this, but I I just want to say so. Uh, Therefore, we we believe we, we think we, we we can recover the uh, the Asimov Ehrman's theorem uh, without assuming the existence of an actual Wu sheaf on the project one. Okay, so uh, let me see how much time. So, okay, hopefully I have need five more minutes or ten minutes. You have plenty of time. We started uh, okay. later. Yeah, I, sorry, I don't know when exactly I started, but anyway. Uh, you you, you have uh, around 18 minutes at least. Okay. Oh, okay. No worries. Yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, so for the rest of the talk, let me let me just uh, 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 sketch the proof of uh, these these two theorems. So again, the the idea is quite simple. We just uh, we try to mimic the Eisenman Schreier or Eisenman Ehrman strategy, but uh, we uh, we want to replace the which sheaf by this uh, limb which sequence uh, and then we will see what, we'll see what happens okay so first let me sketch the proof of the the cohomology table again so as I said like one direction is obvious cx is always contained in C of pn this is nothing but the projection formula and we want to show the other side the so the 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 the, uh, the other containment Okay, so I first uh, we first deal with a vector bundle case. Uh, I let E be a vector bundle supported on a linear subspace, say V inside Pn, and we consider the base change. We look at X cross V, it maps onto V. This is still a linear projection. And we, uh, and we prove that, okay, so now I let, uh, so, so this UE uh, is a, a limb which sequence on this uh, X cross V, Right, and so now we prove that the uh, cohomology table of E uh, is the same as the limit of the cohomology table of the pullback of E tensor with UE. Of course, here I'm computing this cohomology table on X, and on the left hand side, I'm computing the cohomology table on PN. Okay, so you can imagine. So if 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 this U is an actual which sheaf, so then you get you, you get an actual uh, equality where this lambda E is some scalar, a rational a rational number is a, it's a scale, okay? And so this uh, limit is in the uh, component-wise convergence topology, okay? So we, uh, we, we got this simply by just using the property of this, you just replacing Uwish by Lim Uwish, and there are some, you know, computation you have to, you have to do to, to convince yourself that this is, this is true. Okay, and since, since we are just doing like component-wise convergence, uh, you know, you, Basically, you just compute this like uh, for each, for this cohomology table, or just do it for each hi of each twist of, of, of this. Okay, and so this handles the case of a vector bundle. And then uh, to get the result for coherent sheaf, we apply the uh, asimov schreier theorem. So you can, okay, maybe let me just comment a little bit. So here, this only works for vector bundles because if you have a coherent sheaf, so then we have you, we have to worry a little bit about you know this uh, derived pullback or like derived tensor. 
So you you, you get your you get some trouble you know, if if working if just by just you know if you just try to do this argument, but with a coherent shift inside, you get yourself into a little bit of trouble. So and we don't have that, but uh, so instead we just we 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 apply asymptotic trials theorem, right? Remember their result tell us. Uh, if I have a coherent sheaf on Pn, so then the co-module table can be written uh, as a convergent series of co-module table of vector bundles on linear subspaces. Okay, and so then we uh, we apply their theorems. So you re it, it re since we are, we only care about the the closure of the cone in in any way. So we so 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 basically this equation reduces uh, the question of coherent sheaves to uh, vector bundles on linear subspaces. So we just apply step one uh, to each of this uh, EQ. Okay, so this is the strategy of the proof. And uh, let me just say one more. So uh, so you see, uh, we, let me just go back to these theorems. Uh, so in this theorem, we want to work with over the real cone. Uh, well, the only reason is that uh, we, uh, <coughs> The reason is that we apply this result of asymptotic shrub, and in their theorem, uh, they are saying like uh, this convergence is in the real cone, uh, and uh, and uh, they actually I think they actually raised this question whether this AQ could be taken to be rational numbers, but and they could prove it in many many cases, but not in general. So in general, uh, it looks like they uh, they they do not know the answer. Okay, so that's why we need to work with the real cone in this in this co module table. All right, so let me also uh, sketch the uh, idea behind the proof of the, uh, the Betty tables. So again, uh, one direction is, uh, is, 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 uh, is well known. So we know that uh, the Betty cone, the, the Betty, the cone of Betty table of A is always contained in the cone of Betty table of R, so just by tensor. Okay. And so now, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm you're skipping all the details, so uh, so we first deal the uh, uh, we first prove the uh, the positive characteristic case. We assume the field has a positive characteristic, and then uh, uh, using this again, we make use of the Lim Wuish sequence. Uh, we can prove that the two cones B R and B A have the same closure in the uh, finite topology. Okay, so this this one this is already uh, uh, much more uh, subtle. Than this, than this uh, step one here, uh, because this is again this limit I said is uh, component-wise convergence. While here we have to work with a stronger topology, right? So uh, because remember we are living inside this infinite-dimensional vector space, and for finite topology uh, we request I uh, so uh, sorry I didn't let me just mention this in words. So uh, so basically you we, we want a set is open uh, if and only if its uh, restriction to uh, any finite dimensional subspace uh, is open in the usual uh, Euclidean topology. Okay, so this is, and I think in this case, because BRBA lives inside this, uh, uh, you know, countable copy of Q, so this topology is the same as the topology such that uh, you make all the linear functionals on this, uh, on this, uh, on this infinite dimensional vector space to be continuous with respect to this topology. Okay, so we, uh, we, we, uh, we prove that these two cones have the same closure in this uh, more in this finer uh, topology. So this is uh, well, there are some easy examples showing like you know uh, some sequence converge to uh, some sequence in the in the pointwise topo convergence topology does not imply uh, they they converge in this uh, finite topology. So this is uh, more subtle than the uh, pointwise convergence. Okay, but anyway, we prove that, and then. Uh, in the second step, we, uh, we, we, we again, we, we, we observe that the, the isomer Schreier and the isomer Ehrman's results, uh, so they imply that uh, the Betty cone of A uh, is closed in the finite topology. So this follows uh, from their, there's this very explicit description of the cone. Remember, they, uh, let's just think about the isomer Schreier's result. Isomer Schreier's result saying like every co module table can be written as a as a sum of these uh, cohomology tables of uh, pure resolutions, and so basically the extremal rays of the cones are are these like pure diagrams, and you know you can you can show like 
you know, so locally in the finite topology, so locally they are just simply show fans with a with a finite number of extreme arrays. So this is this is closed. Okay. Uh, but then uh, you uh, you conclude immediately that the two cones are the same in in positive characteristic because uh, we have one cone uh, lived inside the other cone and they they have the same closure, but the first one is closed already. So uh, that just saying like the two cones are the same in positive characteristic. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, uh, so this is everything this still happens in characteristic P because we, we use the lean Boolean sequence. So, but uh, the, well, the, now the, uh, the magic happens. So now you can use reduction modulo P uh, to obtain the result in equal characteristic zero. So again, there are some subtleties in this step, but eventually uh, everything is going to be fine uh, be, because you, again, this is, this is essentially due to Eisenman Schreier and Eisenman Ehrman's result because they gave an explicit description of the cone. They, the extreme arrays are just the, the pure diagrams, but the pure diagrams, remember the, the, that the uh, pure resolution is just you know, a shift of the degree sequence. It's, it's the pure resolution is completely determined by this degree shift. So they have nothing to do uh, with the characteristic. And you can actually show that the cone is the same in each characteristic. And, so, and because of that, uh, uh, sort of that, that fact, uh, allows us to apply some standard techniques of a reduction modulo P uh, to obtain the result in characteristic zero. Okay, but I should I should comment that uh, we don't know any uh, straightforward way to prove it in equal characteristic zero, and we also do not know uh, the existence of lim Wuish sequence in equal characteristic zero. So those things uh, like relies on the Frobenius. So this is only works in characteristic P. Okay, so. Uh, and uh, in the last few minutes, sorry, I mean, just I just want to quickly sketch uh, one application. So this is uh, the so-called uh, multiplicity conjecture. Uh, so this was originally conjectured only for uh, polynomial rings, but now we can extend this conjecture for uh, to singular. Uh, uh, it was originally conjectured for polynomial ring, and it was proved by Eisenberg Schreier using the uh, using the uh, Brian Soderberg uh, uh, conjecture, the, the, the decomposition. Okay, and so now we can extend this conjecture to the singular case. So the statement is that, so R is a standard graded ring of dimension N plus one, and M is a graded module of finite length and finite projected dimension that is generated in degree zero. And so then we can give a, a lower bound on the length of the module in terms of the multiplicity of the ring. And well, I, I, I'll be a little bit vague here, but the numerator are just, you look at the, you look at a, a free resolution of M, you have all these shifts in degree. And basically the numerator is the product of all the minimal shifts in each homological degree, right? Again, this is just some like very explicit numbers you can read off immediately from the uh, finite free resolution, okay? And this was originally uh, 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 conjectured by uh, uh, many people, maybe Huniki, uh, Herzer, Srinivasan, and Boyan Soderberg comes, comes up with this idea that uh, if you can decompose the uh, the cohomology table into like pure diagrams, so then you you can get this for free. And since Asimov Schreier proved the uh, Brian Soderberg conjecture, they get this multiplicity conjecture for polynomial rings. And now we can extend it sort of using the same. It's it's literally the same proof. Um, so use this because we, the two cones are the same. And Asimov Schreier gave the explicit description of the cone. The extreme arrays are just the the pure diagrams. So you reduce the question to the case when M has a pure resolution. But in a pure resolution case, this is well known. It follows from a computation by uh, Huniki and Mueller that uh, for if M has a pure resolution, this is this is no. And you, you actually also have an upper bound, but I, I will omit it. So, okay, so this is literally the same proof uh, uh, used in a polynomial ring case. Uh, but now since we have this BR equals to BA, uh, we can extend it uh, I mean, uh, with no difficulty to the to the singular case. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So thank you for your attention. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lin uh, Let me have things in the room. Okay. Okay. Let me stop uh, recording.